All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the uh, June 7, 2023, Wednesday occurrence of the combined work group meeting. Uh, I will present the content. There we go. Okay, so first up, a uh, quick update on 118 release. Uh, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we're just down to the release notes and uh, having David update um, the, the 118 in Netlify. Netlify. Yeah, I think the release notes mm -hmm. merge now, so I think it is just the Netlify thing. Then um, I okay. can take the do not merge tag off the publish and we're, we're okay. Sounds good. I've got in touch with David on uh, inter uh, Google internal chat and I've asked them to follow up on your uh, on your inter on your chat on Slack. So he should be able to take care of that today. Awesome, great. All right, with that, I'll hand over to Whitney. Hi everyone. Um, I came across this feature called shared mask config that I see is experimental. And the last work done on it was back in March, 2021. And uh, um, for my understanding of it, I believe this is something that can be useful when um, mesh cloud providers offer, um, well, tr attempt to protect their users from using problematic uh, mesh configuration. And I'm curious on what are the community thoughts on like, why is this still experimental? and what's stopping it from being graduated. Is anyone aware of it? I know John did some work there back. Um, John was the last person who contributed to it where um, he added some additional test cases. Generally, most things mesh config, Costin has an eye on and a lot of the history of, but I don't see him with us this morning. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of context on it, but um, I mean, the answer of why is it still experimental is kind of a hard, it's kind of a <laughs> philosophical question almost, right? Well, most features in Istio are experimental. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on it? And I think this is something that could potentially be adopted for other config maps where we want to provide merging. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts there to share. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty small feature. We use it in uh, our, our service mesh distribution pretty extensively. I haven't had any issues with it. OK, great. Well, oh, I'll ping Custom offline to see what is his thoughts, but happy to hear there's no issues with it really beyond, I guess, just feature graduation. Whitney Niranyan shared in the chat a uh, ongoing task to better leverage this feature in our end-to-end -end tests. So uh, that might actually help our case for graduation as well. Perfect. Sounds good. So um, no problems. It's just to get it going with graduation and to even see if there's room to adopt in other config maps, correct? Cool. Thank you. And the next one is my topic as well. Um, I would like to propose an, an enhancement subgroup. I can go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Okay, great. Um, so I've been working on the feature maturity and feature flagging um, proposal. And this enhancement subgroup is one of the outcomes of that, where based on our discussions, I think we can all agree that to up, we require explicit regular attention to upkeep our overall feature hygiene in Istio. And as such, I'm proposing this enhancement subgroup to help us get in, well, get 
towards closer to our goal of just keeping Istio in good feature hygiene stage. Um, some further background, I believe we all know that Istio, um, as an open source project, we strive for feature completion and we want the best solution for our users. And as of right now, Istio features a vast, um, it consistently evolves in maturity and relevance and does require additional oversight than what we are currently given to it to keep the product as healthy as possible. And I'm proposing delegating this oversight to an enhancements feature hygiene management subgroup, um, ideally under the user experience working group. At first, I was proposing it as a working group, but in second thought, um, I decided a subgroup is much better as we are in the very early stages of refining what this oversight looks like. And um, I'm hoping that we can build more momentum as well as like feedback and processes before even um, graduating this to a working group if needed. And I believe there was a bit hesitation of adding additional working groups as well because of the additional processes required. So I hope that this subgroup sort of addresses that and gives us a great place for us to get the ball going where it's it's work that can be done beyond me and we can ensure that it continues throughout Istio's life cycle. Um, so with that said, the subgroup will be focused on defining processes and strategies for incentivizing the community to contribute to the overall hygiene of all of our features. Um, one of the benefits of this subgroup, it's taken like a high level um, overview of all of Istio. Um, I believe as contributors, we often get really bogged down in our own specific feature. So um, this subgroup will try to be as unbiased as possible and pretty much look at promoting Istio as a whole. And the overall mission is to provide absolute assurance that all the features in Istio is in a given stage and it fits the criteria for that stage, as well as the features in Istio are in momentum, whether that momentum is moving up, moving out, or simply under evaluation for um, further action. The scope of the group will be the enhancements repo meaning that's like the place that the group will mainly focus and create processes and um reference points from i believe i heard something is someone raising my hand oh. yeah i was it's just the, asking whether so the, as of right now um go ahead sorry oh, sorry go ahead uh, oh, i was just uh mentioning or asking whether the user experience working group was still active. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Justin, that, that uh, working group is hypothetically still active as any other working group. Um, without right. any regular meetings, aside from the combined ones, all of our working groups are sort of in a odd ephemeral status. Um, the, the only meetings we have are this combined one, which covers all of the working groups and then the ambient one, which doesn't have a working group. Right. So, so I guess, would it make sense, um, assuming that this moves forward, that maybe that would be the impetus to, to start meeting regularly for that one? Or do you think it would meet under the combined one? I'm proposing meeting separately and still coming yeah. back to the combined working group with um, mm -hmm. action items and different awareness artifacts. Makes sense to me. Yeah, can we get, a, I think this is a great idea. Can we get a who um, for folks on the call, like who would be joined and have Andrews to help with this? Yes, and we're looking for one to two additional leaders as well as members as well, if you don't wanna take on any leadership roles. If you don't mind me, I'll, I'll, I'll like to, to you know, participate at least as a member to at least push back on some uh, some of the things because uh, I may have some some ideas. Cool. Um, are you able to add your name to this stuff? Yeah, I'll, I'll add myself. Yes. Okay, great. And if anyone else is interested, okay. please go ahead. 
So given is your meetings, uh, community meetings are open to all, maybe we should put out a community calendar for people to contribute um, when they have time. I think it's good just making sure, you know, everyone's invited and then people can decide based on their availability. I like that. And as of now, I'm still, I'm hoping to get feedback along the lines of how regularly we should meet um, and like just, I guess I know the operations of the group before actually kicking off our first meeting, but I do it and to open it on the community calendar for all to contribute. Whitney, I'm happy oh. to help move this forward for you. Uh, I don't know if that necessarily means being in a lead role, but I'm happy to uh, help with the docs, help help with the policy, and this is important work. Yes, I'm glad to hear. Thank you so much. Um, okay, great. So I'm taking that as you'll be potentially a leader for now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, one one thing I wanted to I wanted to add is that we should, um, in the spirit of getting you know, being inclusive and, and getting even more feedback, uh, this might be a good um, a good topic to potentially bring up in, in Slack as well, since I know that folks. Uh, privacy folks who can't make this meeting due to time zones, um, who might also be interested in participating. That's a great suggestion. So I'll post this doc and what will be the best channel to post it in? The general or? Contributors maybe? Yeah, I think the contributor channel would probably be best. Perfect. And um, I can continue going over what I have as of now, but the duck is always there to review too. Um, will you all be interested in me continuing on? Cool, I'll take that as no objections. So um, like I said, I'm still working through the operations of the group to make sure that we, one, keep a regular cadence as well as we as most effective as possible. Um, the group will operate ideally under a mandate of creating structure and routinely reviewing the features, raising awareness and incentivizing action. So I've broken that down into like a six step process or sprint cycles of, as of right now, where um, we will actively go over the features. At the end of that, we wanna present that current state of the features to the TOC, where um, certain discussions and decision points can be made before um, we go ahead and update like any artifacts we have that capture our overall features. And these artifacts can take the form of like dashboards, documentation, feature backlogs, so on. Um, once we have that in place, we then wanna bring it to the community where we can drive feature ownership or the community taking action. And this will be when we bring back our deliverables to the combined working group, as well as um, maybe posting in Slack and blog posts or whatever, um, after which we want to keep a regular routine of um, retrospecting on our structure and our processes and update those processes accordingly and just repeat on this at a high level is how I view this working group operating. So the, uh, the responsibilities of the subgroup, sorry, is will span across like feature awareness um, stuff related to feature maturity, um, feature hygiene, as well as like um, ownership of features and a good byproduct of the work that we are doing as well is community engagement. And to double click into each now, um, I see the subgroup being responsible for creating and maintaining visibility of like existing features so that um, the TOC or the community can take various actions. So for instance, the TOC may be able to use these um, this visibility to make technical decisions accordingly. Um, and most importantly, see features that are at risk of deprecation or hasn't moved for a while and may be called to like trigger like user surveys or um, simply take make a decision around the lines of, is this feature worth saving because it's a, it's in high demand, it's a core feature and help prioritize 
um, the effort towards that feature along among all the other features that are worth saving. And then from the community perspective, um, I've heard a lot of community members ask like, how can they differentiate between core and optional features? Um, a lot of us want to understand what is the current stage of that feature so we can see the roadmap for stability before deciding if we want to use it or contribute to it. Um, sometimes when we aren't, when we don't have our own like agenda around like what features we want to develop, it would be nice to see like a backlog of prioritized features in which we can potentially contribute to. And this part of it is along the lines of um, the TSC maintaining that backlog of features that is needed by Istio um, to keep like good hygiene and overall product health. And this prioritized list is not intended to like block the community from working on whatever they want to work on, but just to provide guidance on what exactly is our needs right now and what uh, high impact features that you can contribute to. And also like just being aware of like the features that are at risk of deprecation. For instance, if I as community members see my feature um, is potentially at risk, I will hopefully be driven or guided to take action to do whatever to um, keep that feature and graduate it forward. And uh, in regards to maturity, um, we want to get on top of like the overall feature life cycle and create and maintain processes that help shine that from design proposal to like the feature moving up to each stage until it becomes stable. And that will take the form of utilizing the enhancement checklist more proactively, um, doing regular reviews of the feature, its maturity, and figuring out ways in which to incentivize graduation. Um, this will also help us um, raise awareness along the lines of the features that are at risk of deprecation whether it's due to whatever technical pivots um, or lack of momentum, et cetera. And as of now, we are using deprecation as more of like a, a trigger to take action than truly deprecate. And the subgroup will be responsible for outlining those um, processes and actions needed to be taken. And then of course, actually applying feature flags, which is the other proposal that I'm working on. Um, the subgroup will be one of the the stakeholders in ensuring that features have its relevant feature flag if needed. Um, let's see what else. So on the feature hygiene, it's pretty much along the same lines where it's like establishing and maintaining a recurring cadence for validating features, um, as well as like incentivizing um, features are improved and ensuring the features are actually improved. Um, and I can, this one is pretty interesting because now um, we have, I'm hoping that we can create a space where we could actually apply learnings from users and do more architectural design brainstorming sessions among the community and um, pretty much just apply that to any feature work that's been to be done, especially if that feature doesn't necessarily have an owner as yet. Um, and uh, Along the lines, we also want to promote feature ownership, where even if a subgroup member has the temporary own core features to ensure that deprecation can be stopped or that graduation can occur, or simply to find or find ways to evangelize this feature among the community for people that have the cycle to pick up owning this feature. And uh, um, the last responsibility, like I mentioned, is community engagement, where now as we streamline these processes and provide these visibility and discussions, um, I believe this is a perfect place where we can help onboard new contributors to Istio um, and help navigate like um, the vastness that Istio is. Um, so this, all of this is a work in pro progress and um, I look forward to continuing working on this as well as hearing everyone's feedback. As of now, the roadmap, um, we are currently focused on the operations of the subgroup. So figuring out like the policies and stuff we need to put in place to ensure that the enhancement subgroup move forward and everyone is aware of it and can contribute to it. 
And then from there, I believe the next steps will be reviewing the future stages, refining the criteria for each future stage and proposing changes to the enhancement checklist as this checklist will ideally now become the main source of truth for features in Istio. I know it's already that, um, but I know there's a lot of like um, backporting and stuff to do. And uh, after which we will then hopefully kick off our sprints of like actually reviewing features and going down the line of um, the different steps that we will be taking regularly as a group. Um, and that's the end of my proposal for now. I think I saw some, let me stop share, respond to the messages. Hey, Gustin, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit worried about uh, the scope of this uh, working group and the overlap with Ambient and, you know, what happens with Ambient because uh, we have a lot of features in Istio that will just disappear with Ambient. We mm -hmm. have a number of APIs that, even, even APIs that are beta that probably are going to be at risk or, or even, even if they're deprecated, will not be supported in Ambient. We have the gateway and gamma APIs we are trying to adopt that require some, some you know, more or less dramatic changes in, in, in the API uh, supportability. Uh, with all this going on, I am very worried about trying to, to promote features that are not going to be supported in ambient, that don't match with, with the model in gamma, or that they don't have a, well-defined APIs that is compatible with, with, with Gateway and, and try to move them forward. Mm -hmm. I'm all for deprecating. I mean, if we could deprecate, I would be, you know, super happy to see to see the efforts to actually kill features that are not tested and are not well supported. But I was not aware we have this liberty because we don't have, I mean, we never actually deprecated anything that is at risk of breaking someone who's using it. So um, that big, I mean, we, we, we pretend, we, we, we say, hey, we'll deprecate, we'll deprecate, but we never, we very rarely do that. So we yeah. don't really have a stick. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's a good point. And I'm happy you brought that up because like I mentioned, we, as a subgroup, we want to figure out how we actually design the sprints of reviewing features and stuff. One of the thoughts that I had was aligning with re release goals. And um, I believe based on what you said and based on like the progress in ambient one of the sprint cycles we take can be simply like reviewing features based on what will happen when ambient is here so i don't think that the first couple cycles of the subgroup should be immediately jump into deprecation but pretty much figuring out like what is the different things that can dictate what features stick around or not or the relevance of features so um, that's definitely something I will take into consideration. Um, I see Keith's hand is up. You want to go next? Yeah, I think oh, my I think my question is is kind of more towards uh, is to Costin. Uh, as far as ambient, um, I I know that eventually the goal is for a lot of features to to disappear, become um, redundant. But I don't know, I, I don't necessarily see that being uh, a very fast process. Um, like if you take virtual service, for example, people are going to be using that for a very long time. Um, and even though we want to move folks over to Gateway API and Gamma, you know, there's still use cases and scenarios that need to work out with Gateway in, in, in the mesh use cases. And so um, I think that this group, I, I agree with you, like long term, hopefully they go away. But in the, in the meantime, I think that's probably a pretty, a, a, maybe a wider, a, a longer mean time than any of us would probably like. Uh, I think we still need to kind of put the attention here, make sure the features are are, are, are safe and stable and we're following the process. Uh, right, but uh, sorry, okay, I think I'm misunderstanding. My, my point was that we should not promote APIs that will be deprecated by Ambient or go away in Ambient. So I think the focus should be on, on making sure ambient ships with table features, we don't ship experimental stuff or we have, but uh, it will be counterproductive to, to, to promote APIs to beta when, when, when few months, few one, six months later, we're going to, 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 to remove them. Anyway. 
do we have a list of those features as yet? Um, I think yes. we need to clarify here, we're not removing sidecar mode. Uh, Ambient does not replace sidecar mode in Istio. We've communicated to our users that sidecars will be around for the foreseeable future. So the maturity process for features that are only about sidecars is still completely valid because those are going to be around for years to come. I, I mean, promoting more features that apply to sidecars that will not be supported. So we, everything we have today, we definitely plan to support forever. But my concern was about adding more to the API surface that we need to support forever if it's not going to be supported in ambient and it's going to add additional I mean, not, I'm not, I never said we are removing the sidecar resource. It's an example of things that exist in, in uh, Istio, but doesn't exist in Ambient. And just yeah. to recap, oh, sorry. Um, just to clarify on my end, you're pretty much saying be careful with promoting features to stable if we know eventually we don't want to support that forever. Yes. OK, thanks. You could go ahead, Mitch. No, I, I think I think that's a great summary. Uh, Kostin, I don't think we're talking about adding new features or new APIs. We're talking about categorizing the ones that we already have and making sure that our on-paper commitment to those features and our testing and as well as all of our other you know, hygiene is up to date with the expectations that we've created in our customers. Uh, so, for instance, virtual service, as far as I know, there are no plans to deprecate that. That's going to be around forever. So we should have a review of its feature maturity, make sure that it's properly tested uh, and that there's not a mismatch between what our users expect of virtual services stability and what we intend to offer as a community. I, I think I think you guys have covered most of what I was going to say. With, but my interpretation was less that this is that this group has an agenda about mindlessly just promoting things, but more just sort of making sense of the different APIs and the levels that they have, and just trying to make things more maintainable and understandable to the end users. In which case, I think that is good because it is confusing between what Ambient will eventually bring and what Sidecar has and how all of that will work. I completely agree with that. I do share the concern with Kostin that I just don't really get what the output is, though. Like, say what Mitch says we do, we evaluate virtual service, we decide it's terrible. Well, now what? One of the outputs could be putting it behind a feature flag. Um, I think we still have to explore what deprecation really looks like. But for now, um, feature gating is one of the potential outputs of a feature that is at risk. Well, I, I think there's two potential outcomes when we find a, a feature at risk. One is that we, we move it to a lower level of maturity, uh, which could include flagging, et cetera. The other is that we find developer resources to assign to that to bring it up to snuff. If virtual service has insufficient testing, I would much rather each of our companies go and try to find somebody to add tests to it to bring it up to par for all of our other stable features than to blindly deprecate. Does that make sense? Yeah, a few comments. One, I don't think anything that's beta plus can ever go down. You can't say something's beta and then just kidding, it's actually alpha. Uh, maybe alpha we could, even then it's pretty questionable. Like deprecate it, yes, but downgrading to experimental seems odd. The other thing is I, I agree with the theory that we go say, hey, virtual service needs help. Um, I'm just not sure with the with the practice, like why, like as a vendor, why would some subgroup of the user experience telling me that virtual service is low quality incentivize me to go contribute to it? Like it's not a mystery that there's parts of Easter that need maintenance and tests and documentation improvements, right? I just don't know that us saying it again solves much on its own. Mm -hmm. Like if you see the enhancements repo, we have like all these PRs and all these checkbox exercises. Like I don't feel like that actually brought any value to the project, but it spent a lot of time and it, you know, it was just kind of busy work. 
I think a couple of things, John. One, I, I agree with your assessment of kind of the existing state of the enhancements repo, but I think the I think what was missing from that was is accountability. Um, how are people being? You know, where where is the reminder to make sure that we're talking about this? How are we? Uh, how often are we making sure this is brought up and, and addressed? Um, and to your point about you know the what use is the signal of the subgroup um, if it marks a resource as not being and not having being at risk or not having enough quality. Uh, I can speak for Microsoft and say that qu quality is something that we we care about. And when we are supporting a, a service, I, I would hope that to some degree, uh, and I know this to be true, um, because we do acquire things like tests, we do have have gating. Like quality is something that I, I, as, a, as an Istio vendor, we care about. And as a user, they absolutely care about making sure that things that they are using are in production, uh, potentially, you know, costing, you know, a, a outage costing them hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars in, in revenue. We would hope that the quality is high and that the standards we define that we're following those standards. Um, so, you know, I think that, yes, with the, may it, it might require some gamesmanship from us to talk to management to find resourcing for some of these things. But I think ultimately that's that's how open source software works at the end of the day. Um, you, you you have to advocate to your to your company to the people paying you to work on open source to go and invest um, in those areas that are deemed to be important. And the function of the subgroup is to help us to identify what those areas are, because right now it's not clear where those are. Uh, Keith, I hundred percent agree with you, and if this is a goal, I I'm I'm hundred percent behind it. Uh, my concern, which I was trying to explain earlier, is about taking stuff that is currently experimental and pushing it to to promoting it to, to to stable and so forth. If the goal is to take a look at the beta features like virtual service in this example and make sure that it's super tested, it's super safe to upgrade and and uh, basically to take the, the stable features and, and double down on them and make them you know filter out the weeds, stick the, the verify client at the verify cert at client, for example which is a horrible default that we have, but we need to fix it somehow. I mean, taking stuff that is already used in production. I was worried about the opposite of taking, taking stuff that is, you know, stuck in, in experimental because it's not, you know, has known problems and try to, to, to push it forward and try to take more immature stuff and, 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 and declare it better and, you know, kind of make the problem bigger. I think I'll defer to Whitney here, uh, of course, because she wrote the proposal. But in my in my mind, it's a matter of priority, right? I think both are in scope for something like this. I think um, you know, making sure that we don't have features that are perma alpha, perma experimental is also important. But as a matter of you know, limited resourcing and you know, where do we start? I, I agree with you, Austin, that I, it, it makes sense to me to start with those things that are already being used. And try to uh, and, and try to make sure that they are in the right place, whether that's APIs or whatever. So, plus one for me there, but again, defer to the subgroup, the eventual subgroup, to make the decision of where to invest effort initially. Yeah, I agree with that too, Keith. Where I believe before any action is taken, we should be aware of its priority and how it fits in the big picture. Yeah, one thing I want to add, I think we might be thinking a little bit too much you know, for like the like the overall um, like approval for this subgroup. I think it's a great idea, by the way, which I said it earlier, but uh, it's not up to the subgroup to determine whether this particular feature is ready for a given stage, whether that stage is experimental or whether that stage is beta, right? We still have the checklist, uh, which still requires, uh, I believe, more than one TLC member to go through approval. And we also typically present this in the TLC course for general awareness of everybody in the community. So, um, so that should resolve a lot of concern costing you raise about like promoting features which you shouldn't be promoted um, because it's not the direction of ambient is going, right? So what Keith and Whitney is trying to do work for the community, like Ben was saying, help us clean the garden, you know, making sure, you know, we're on track 
for what we claim the status is, and maybe even help us prune some of the experimental features when no one is using them and, uh, you know, and no one is maintaining them. Thanks for that, Lynn. I agree. Is there any other comments? Cool. Um, if not, um, please review the doc, um, add any additional thoughts. Um, please add your name under the leadership or the members section. Um, my immediate next action steps is to post in Slack as well as to continue working on a doc based on your feedback before hopefully kicking off um, setting this up as like a actual subgroup and putting it on the community calendar and so on. Thank you, everyone. All right, well, that's the end of the list of the agenda. Uh, does anyone else have anything else to bring up? I had a couple of documents for review. One is He's about pacing here. Yeah, I can present them. They're also both on the, the working group out there, just in the review. Oh, they're in the review session. OK. The Wasm capability and safer Envoy filter? Yeah, just I'm looking for the Right. The fill? OK. Uh, yeah. Um, Totally different topic, but I, I was curious uh, because I know uh, Keith and myself and team, we are looking to, uh, uh, you know, we're creating CFPs for the upcoming QCon. I, I'm, I'm curious if if we should track like anyone here that may be doing it just to make sure like we're not crossing wires on any, any of the content being proposed. Not sure if that's been done in the past, but just just something I thought about. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Um, we can probably, we usually have like a Slack channel for each KubeCon. We could probably start one now and brainstorm ideas. Uh, I'm sure some people want to talk with, with those as well. So it could be good to find a co-speaker and whatnot. Um, I'll, I'll set that up and invite some folks that I think are interested. But obviously, I won't get everyone. So if you're interested, um, search for it or ask me or whatever. OK, cool. Thanks, John. Okay, so the first one is about Awasom, and that one is about um, basically we want to separate ABI into bits that are stable and less stable. And as part of that effort, we would like to have a declaration on every module saying what part of ABI they're using. That helps with both stability, because right now ABI is undergoing some changes, so this is likely changes at the binary level and second it helps us with security because it also allows us to restrict what modules can and cannot do so i'm just mostly looking for feedback from people who actually using wasm because um, i don't have another way to reach out to users so if you have any thoughts about the structure of how capabilities are defined that would help Yeah, you don't have to respond now if, if anyone is listening. You should just post a comment. I have a the, question about uh, about the declaration piece. Does I, I, I don't follow Wasm super closely, but I uh, know some of the stuff that's going on. Uh, does something like, like Wasm components or, or WASI help here as far as the declaration of capabilities folks looking to use? Um, just, just throwing that out there. I don't know what uh, Envoy support for it would look like, but I'm curious. Yeah, I can, I can give background. So WASI is completely orthogonal to proxy WASM. They don't really share ABI. You cannot run WASI modules on proxy WASM and vice versa. But uh, so as part of development of proxy WASM, there was a lot of uh, shortcuts made in the way that you define those ABI functions so that Right now, they are very coupled with the way that Envoy needs to implement them. So that, that presents a challenge, meaning that the modules that are written 
for Istio and Envoy will not be portable anywhere else. For example, uh, I think Kong and Mosin al also implement the same ABI at the host level. But because of this coupling, you cannot run modules here and there interchangeably. So the real effort is basically trying to make sure that people use only the parts of ABI that are known to be portable and try to down, you know, demote or make sure that people don't accidentally use features that are like more likely to break in the future. Gotcha. Thanks for that context. Sure. Costin. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, um, uh, thank you for for raising this because uh, it's it's a very important uh, issue and also closely related to the previous conversation about alpha experimental. And uh, um, my suggestion would be to do a survey of of the APIs that exist. I mean, I know Cloudflare, for example, has some API for for interacting with WASM. There are probably a few others, and also focus on on the, the security aspects and the isolation aspects of this because as you said wasm has a lot of power and it's very difficult to safely use in a gateway for example and we should probably have you know kind of a narrow mode that that is is uh, is a bit more constraints and than, than what currently is available but uh, surveying you know, current practices would probably be a very good uh, first step. Yeah, that 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 already happened. I actually, I looked at the, some usages that we know of. The problem is that I don't know many of his big customers who are actually using Wasm in production. So part of this effort is to make sure that I I hear the feedback because I, I don't have any other way to reach out. The ones I, I talk to, I am already aware. And the reason for the definition of this uh, groups is basically security. We want to make sure that people don't call features that are not just unstable, but also not secure. So things like uh, side requests, for example, is a big one because uh, that has a potential to leak data or you know cause all kinds of problems. Well, even, even that should be possible with some policies. It's not completely... I mean, it's a very useful call. That's probably one of the most yeah, useful it, Yeah, calls. so I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not saying going to be removed is mostly it should be explicitly opted in it's mostly about making sure that when uh, the module declares it needs that capability rather than just letting every module do anything sure and, and just to be clear um the categorization of basic and advanced and default is something that you have created it's not like a, a wasm standard again like Keith, I'm not super from awesome, but you're basically defining these groupings as like a, a tiered list of access, right? Yeah. So th this, this, there's no, there's no active working group on proxy wasm right now. I mean, they're trying yeah. to resurrect it, but there's no, you know, there's no other people except us really to make progress here. So, so really, what you're looking for is feedback on are, are these basic groups that I've defined in the API like the right buckets. Yeah, and and yeah, but also, yeah. you know, when you, it's an API change, so I'm also looking for approval for the API. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So um, I'll I'll leave it at this, I guess, and just want to talk about the other one. Um, so the other one is our favorite topic: is anyway filter. Just open. So let, let me just give background what this is about. So I, I think we already actually discussed a lot of this before, but um, we have a problem with NY filters is that it lets you do anything, but it's also necessary to do use. So what, what, I'm, what that means is that we know that this API will probably never be stable or graduate to be you know, long-term API just because the way it's designed allows you to do anything. However, people we know that people are using it actively. So it's a it's sort of a contradictory state because we we accept the state where people are using API that is highly unstable in in the mass numbers. So I think that state is is not is not a good state to be in, both in terms of the project health and also in terms of 
you know, vendors trying to deploy Istio in a managed, in a supportable way. Because if you if you simply say and we filter is not allowed, you also leaving out a, a huge number of people, customers who are trying to, who simply have no other way to use Istio without Envoy filter. But if you do allow Envoy filter, you also open up a door to a lot of potentially dangerous situations. It can, they can cause you know, trouble. So the this proposal is about trying to analyze and sort out the different use cases that Envoy, Envoy filters are used for so that we can be more explicit and more you know intentional about allowing people using my filters so what that means for example is that in many cases having a, a blessed envoy filter is a reasonable supportable api um, things like uh, local rate limit which right now has no other user experience except using my filter is a stable extension Envoy. So there's not, not not much danger by allowing using this filter in Envoy. The only the only unsafe part about it is, is the Envoy filter itself. So um, there's more details in this, but uh, what this indeed what I'm trying to um, uh, propose in actual items is, is is that we start enumerating the use cases for Envoy filter. For each use case, we define a better validation and testing in Istio so that no, we don't just al allow it, we also test it and also validate in depth what those NY filters do. And once we have those set of use cases, we each use case will be gated by a flag so so that we can decide uh, which ones of them we can turn on. And then there's going to be a fall through option for the really dangerous Envoy filters to be explicitly allowed. So that's the gist of it. Um, yeah, I just want to give context. This is, this is not about API stability or promotion. This is really about trying to divide and conquer what we have today. Sure, Keith was first, I think. Yeah, I guess my my first question, and uh, I, I read through the initial issue. I think we even had a brief exchange on there, commented on it, uh, but I haven't had a chance to read the doc, so apologies if this is answered somewhere in the doc. Um, but my the first question that comes to my mind is how do we differentiate between safer Envoy filters versus Envoy filters where it's just easy to misconfigure? Um, so the, like the current API, you're can explicitly set like setting the order in the filter chain and, and, and things like of, of that nature. Um, is is how do you kind of differentiate from the, the the scenarios where oh if I put this in the wrong order in my filter chain this is going to make nothing match uh, or this is going to like make a a, a feature further down fail versus dangerous filters because I guess I, in my mind I wouldn't consider the first uh, ex example necessarily dangerous um but yeah do you just have if you have a kind of heuristic or an idea of how to or a philosophy and how to differentiate safer versus just simpler yeah so this yeah this is API. it's not about simplicity it's about safety and by safety i mean data plane safety and uh, and maintainability so what that means the envoy filters that we consider safe should never you know crash data plane should not be allowed to Got do it. things that are potentially, you know, breaking data plane changes. And second, it, for the safe and filters, we should have an idea how to upgrade Istio. We shouldn't be held back. We shouldn't be held back by the safe and filters and be, not being able to upgrade the rest of Istio. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So this is like safe in the classical sense. Gotcha. Makes well. Thank you, mm -hmm. John. Yeah, a few comments. I completely agree with the, the goals. I think this is the right direction. Um, just some implementation comments first. I, I am a bit worried about the upgradability. Um, I, I don't know that any Envoy filters upgrade safe, given that we can potentially, I mean, I guess we can make it true by not breaking them if we have tests for all of them. Um, so maybe that's feasible, but in general, any Istio API and even Kubernetes API has unsafe aspects, right? Like it's unsafe to run a container as privileged 
in pod, but you can do it. And when looking to restrict that, there's you know policy enforcement mechanisms like Kyverno and Gatekeeper or whatever. I I'm wondering if this is really if like built in validation webhook enforcement is kind of the way we want to do this, or if we want to provide guidance on how to lock down Envoy filter, but even maybe other APIs, like there's very bad things you can do with almost every East U API um, as kind of like a stricter mode of East U APIs and, you know, like provide gatekeeper policies or I, I'm not super familiar with the landscape there. So we'd have to look into it, but something along those lines. Uh, or even potentially just like Istio cuddle tooling, like to check whether you meet a stricter definition or something along those lines, or like a grade my config, and it will say your config is garbage, like using experimental unsafe features, or it will say you know B plus, <laughs> you're doing okay, or something along those lines. I don't know. We'd have to designate it through a bit. Um, yeah, I can I can respond to that. So yeah, that's actually the idea. Is it's mostly about user experience. We are not going to make changes to any of the implementation or. You, you know, API itself. It's mostly about driving users away from unsafe Envoy filters by warning them in advance and by making sure they don't, for the safe ones, we can also improve validation because if we know the type of Envoy filter they're trying to do, we can we can understand what it's trying to do and provide better validation. But we cannot do it in a pack way, I think, because we still have to provide tests. Ultimately, what what's most important for the project is to be able to Say you know for this kind of envoy filter that has local rate limit, we const continuously test it and we we know it's upgradable. So it's not just you know it's a guarantee from the project that we can also provide validation for, but ultimately we still have to write tests. So the work to enumerate and categorize is still on us rather than on external validation hook. Costin. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I strongly support this, but uh, I also have some concerns about the implementation and, and uh, the staging. Uh, I completely agree that adding validation, it's a, probably the most effective first step and, and we should do it first. Uh, but fundamentally, the Envoy filter is uh, API is a patch API where you can you know patch individual points in the generated AVDS to do whatever stuff. And that's a fundamentally unsafe thing. And I, I think what, what was discussed in the chat about taking stuff and promoting it to some form of a CRD, which has validation, has, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, maybe following the, the gateway attachment policies, that should be the, the end result of this. I mean, we don't want people to, to, to patch configurations generated by Istio for rate limiting, but they should have a way to attach a rate limiter to a route, for example, within the proper uh, gateway API. Uh, I, I want to make sure we, we get there and we are not talking in, in, we just validate a patch. Yeah, I agree. This, this is not a long term. I mean, the ideal situation, there's no my filter. So the set of safe and filters goes down to zero, but realistically it will take time. So even- uh, I, I know, I know, I know. It's, I, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm fully supportive for starting with validation. Just please make sure in the documentation that the end state will be uh, proper CRDs for, uh, with validation and everything and, and proper API attachment for, for everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we will make sure that safe and my filter is not something that people should expect to be there forever. Yeah, people should eventually will supplement with real APIs and migrate. But um, I mean, one of the problems I see right now is that we, we had this problem that we transitioned from my filter for telemetry to telemetry API, but yet all of our documentation was still using my filter, simply because there is no guardrails, and that that's a unfortunate situation and it's we need to make sure that people migrate off envoy filter and the only way we can do it is by warning and making sure that you know the set of use cases that they use is known by us and we can drive them to the right api for the rate limit for example i mean once we have a rate limit api we can simply warn users trying to the rate limit just don't use this envoy filter use this particular you know rate limit api and we can even probably synthesize it based on the content of Envoy Um I think Lynn was next. 
Uh, yes. Uh, um, so one comment, sorry, I haven't really looked through in detail since I just saw you put it out. Um, so first of all, like the scenarios you uh, put out in the doc, I agree with those are common scenarios, but there are way more scenarios than that. Uh, from a particular vendor perspective, I would like to see vendor have a way to use Envoy filter and not get flagged in any way. Could your proposal endorse uh, that scenario? Like in, in a scenario, you know, we want to use Envoy filter in a particular way. I don't want you to, it's still to flag. That's not safe because, you know, that's for advanced user was, you know, like basic user, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I think the set of safe and the filter should be customizable. I agree. So if you have some particular and my filter in mind, we should allow you know extend the Mistio to support it. That, that's reasonable. What what I want to do is have an have an enumeration of those cases. So we should know we know which which whisk use case it is, why do we need it, and what's the path forward? Because we cannot just simply allow it forever and we need a alternative eventually. Yeah, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, do you, because it's going to be very hard, let's say if there's 100 user cases, it's going to be very hard to collect all that user cases. Would it be possible to for a vendor to say, hey, for this Envoy filter, it would be totally okay as long as you know, it's tested um, and not kind of flag that envoy filter in any way to say it's not safe because I, I honestly i'm not sure how you're going to flag to the user because envoy filter doesn't have a status field right now um yeah so we just warn i think it's just still analyze we warn and it's just a warning. We don't. We don't have a way to flag. This okay. Thing. Yeah. So the problem is, let's say uh, we sh uh, a vendor ships like two envoy filter, uh, and then the user run is your cardo commands, uh, analyze the entire cluster. You know, is there any way to say these two filter? I don't want to be flagged as part of the warning. So we need to customize this to CTL. I mean, if you have a particular, we might even have like a first party. You know. Envoy built-in extension that you want to use with Envoy filter. In that case, we need to be able to extend Istio CTL to allow you know specific kinds of Envoy filters. And I think I'm not entirely sure how we can. I think we need to design it still. How to? Yeah. How do you address. detect that? Yeah. 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 Okay. I started with a small set, but I I, I understand that it's going to be more. And I, I think what's important is be, being able to enumerate those things rather than you know, it's just, just basically say everything is allowed. Because once we have enumeration, we can start looking into each one and start figuring out how to promote it away from a filter. But we, we need this categorization as a first step. OK, yeah, sounds good. Thanks for considering that requirement. Um, yeah, Niranjan, I think we might be out of time, but uh, if you want to stick. Uh, we are all the time, but the next meeting, which is the ambient meeting, does not apparently have any um, agenda on it right now. Okay, yeah, Niranjan, I think you are next. Okay, uh, I think um, Ben had his hand up before me. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I didn't see. Ben. No, yeah, I was just going to say what I put in chat that I think, like, it, it, it's unclear to me if this is about giving operators policy controls for what they want to allow in their cluster, or if it's Istio, the project, saying we have an, we don't want you to use Envoy filters in this way. We are trying to discourage their use along these lines. Those are, to me, two different things. Um, we should probably pick which one we care about. If it's both, that's fine. But I think those are very different. Um, and and we, I think the the Istio, the project, having an opinion that you should not use Envoy filters in a certain way is fine, probably good. Um, but that's a very different set of solutions than, you know, like I think he was saying in chat, um, you know, letting operators say, I allow this kind of Envoy filter here and not here and blah, 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 and CRDs and all that. Those are two very different things um, with different different solutions, I think. I don't think they can be the same solution, really. Or if if the, the solution is we don't actually want to have an opinion and just want to give operators all the tooling, that's fine. Then that's that just do that, right? That That's a different kind of solution than Istio saying we want to discourage the use of this thing. 
yeah so i mean the the, the outcome should be the tooling really to allow vendors and operators to control what sort of Envoy filters are allowed. But it should also be an opinion by the project, which, you know, what kind of default we ship. And the, the, this, they will come together, but the opinion of the project can be overridden by vendors. And that's that's part of the requirement, I think. I think the, the ultimate goal is for, for an operator or vendor to be able to safely operate Istio. And if the choice is that, in my cluster, in my you know managed product, I do not allow any Envoy filter except those three. That should be enforceable because otherwise, again, you cannot respect the the the, the stability goals of the of the customer, and that needs to be part of the Istio code somehow. Even if open source Istio say you can use whatever filter you want, don't worry. I'll make sure to update the doc of the feedback. Sure, go ahead. Ranjan. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, in, in addition to Envoy filters, um, there are uh, several other ways, I guess, of configuring the proxy or sidecar that I guess could be considered unsafe. So you have the proxy config uh, CR, and then on top of that, um, you also have uh, the proxy config annotations and um, uh, the component of the mesh config, uh, default config, where uh, you could configure other sidecar environment variables and, and settings, for example. Um, I was just wondering, it, um, would is that also uh, I know like your proposal is specific for Envoy filters, but would that also sort of fall under the same scope of um, sort of kind of safer configuration of the proxy? Um, that's not the scope right now because I think Envoy filter is a big enough challenge by itself. So yeah, there's lots of APIs that can be unsafe, but Envoy filter is the most appalling one, right? So it's, that's why it's, the focus is to just get um, it's just in my filters right now. Oh, that's all I have. So if, if um, we can move to ambient. Francis, do you want to? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'm actually on both meetings right now. Hang on one sec, guys. Okay, I am going to end this meeting uh, and let's hop on the MA meeting.